welcome back to Find and Fix and Race Them. Uh, this is going to be a little bit different kind of episode. Um, I know you might have saw the title and you're like, oh, he's got a KTM. No, I don't have a KTM 495 anymore. But I did have one. I had one for about three years. Well, I had a longer nap, but I raced it for about three years, 2008 to 2010, 11, something like that. Um, the 81 KTM 495's kind of claim to fame was that it went like 123 miles an hour in the desert or something. They did gear it up. That's not stock gearing. Um, they geared it up a little bit, but other than that, it went 123 miles an hour. And they could, oh, fastest dirt bike ever. But in reality, it's not, I mean, in stock form, yes. Is it faster than a KX500? Maybe um, you have a lot of wind resistance because those uh, radiator shrouds stick out. And when you're going that fast, it causes a lot of wind resistance. So, um, you know, is it as fast as the KX500? No, I've ridden a KX500. It's not as fast as the KX500, but considered the fastest uh, dirt bike ever, just top speed wise. Um, I raced it and vented. Well, what happened was it, I had a massage therapist, not that kind of massage therapist, massage therapist. And uh, she, she found out that I raced because I was beat up and always a lot of knots and stuff. And uh, she uh, said her husband had a dirt bike that he wanted to sell. And I was like, okay, well, cool. Um, so I, he wasn't there, asked her what it was. She didn't know. I called him that night and he said, oh, it's 81 KTM 495. Are you interested? And I'm like, yeah, is it complete? And he's like, yeah, it's complete, but it's blown up, needs a top end. And I'm like, well, how much you want for it? And he's like, 450 bucks. And I'm like, oh, I'm in. Yeah, um, for sure. So I went over there, it was complete. The um, top end was hammered. Uh, it needed board and a new piston. But yeah, it was all there. So I brought it home, getting a piston for KTM 495. Maybe it's different now, I don't know. But back around 2008, 2009, there was nothing. And I found a guy that had a, that had had Weisco make a run of pistons for him and he had them on eBay and they weren't cheap. It was like 300 bucks, 350 bucks for a piston and rings and a pin and a circle clip, I mean, it was expensive and it was last overboard because it, that bike had already been bored and it was pretty beat up. So I was on the last overboard, but I got a board out. Um, and, you know, from the first time I started that bike, it just ran really good. I mean, it, it, it just always ran really good, which is, you know, pretty awesome. So once I got it running, I took the bike out to the desert and it, you know, it, it ran well and I was like, ah, I'm ready to race it. And one thing that happened that I didn't really, I kind of noticed when I rode it out in the desert, but I didn't know it was going to be quite a big issue is I was having a clutch issue on the bike. And you could get it into gear, you pull the clutch in, you could get it into gear, but it would creep when you started giving it gas. Um, and you couldn't keep it from creeping. Well, you could hold the front brake. That's what I did. So what I would normally get, what I did on the first race, first couple, I had some clutch problems with it for a bit, but you know, I'll get a little bit back further from the gate than I normally would. And I would have the clutch in, I'd be holding the front brake and it would still almost be pushing the bike forward. And I would just try to time it. So um, I wouldn't run into the gate. And I managed to get really good starts with it. The bike, you know, it, it was fast, um, but the clutch was an issue for a while. And it, it actually led to a pretty funny story. I, I, well, I thought it was funny. It would have been fantastic footage to have. I would have loved to have this footage, but I'll tell you about it. So I got the whole shot and I'm winning the race. This is a, a speed world in Phoenix where they used to do vintage racing. They don't even race at that track anymore. There's only two tracks in Arizona, I think anymore, maybe three, but it's kind of a private track. Um, but at Speed World, every vintage race that we would have, we would race about once a month usually, 
they would change the track, which was really cool because it was always a little bit different layout. And they put this little section in before the finish. It was like a little S turn and they didn't water it very well at all. And it just kind of turned to silt. I mean, it was really silty and it was kind of tricky in there because it was really soft and you couldn't, you know, you would just kind of move around a lot. And I was on the last lap and I had a pretty decent lead and I come into this last corner and I'm only 30, 40 yards from the finish. I can see the checkered flag. And I come in and I push the, I like lose the front a little bit and tip it over. And it's laying on the left side of the bike. It's still running. So I reach down, grab the clutch, pick it up. But remember the clutch doesn't disengage and it was warm. And soon as the wheel hit the ground, it got up onto the wheel, it just took off. And it started to move, and I didn't even have my leg on it yet. I had just picked it up. It started to move, which caused the bike to go like this, which caused me to give it gas. And now the bike's wheeling, and I'm surfing beside it with both my feet being drugged behind it, kind of weaving all over the track in this silt. And I finally somehow managed to just like thrust my chest up onto the seat. So now I'm surfing on it with just my chest and weaving all over the track. And in my mind, I'm like, you gotta go, gotta go. People are coming, people are coming. You gotta get up, get the bike. Kind of panicking, which I should have been a little more calm, I'll admit. But I was kind of panicking because I, you know, I've been leading the whole race. I didn't want to lose 30 yards before the finish. And I'm weaving all over the place and I finally get back up on the bike and I just like right across the finish. I used more energy in those 30, 40 yards to get to the finish that I probably did the entire race. It was, I mean, I was panting like a dog. I was so tired. It was, it would have been pretty funny footage to have. Um, but I had this clutch issue for a while and I couldn't, I put a different inner basket on it. The outer basket was fine. And there was like a uh, clutch adjustment on the inside. You had to take the clutch cover off yeah, like a set screw. And finally, what I figured out doing is I left the clutch cover off and I just, for whatever reason, the, at least on that particular bike, it, the, the clutch had to be adjusted absolutely perfect on that adjustment or it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't work. So what I did is I just would turn it a little bit. I would have it in gear and I would just roll the rear wheel and see if I could get it to go. And I finally got it adjusted where I could actually get the clutch to slip and after that I never had another problem with it. But it was a little problematic for the first two or three races I raced it. But once I got it figured out, never any problems with it. So one thing I noticed when I did the top end was that it's a very short stroke motor for a 500 um, in the KTM 495. Um, compared to like a KX500 or a CR500, the stroke is much shorter, huge piston, short stroke. And what that did was it caused the engine to rev really quickly. And what would happen is if you broke the rear tire loose, it would really break loose on that bike. So you had to be very careful to not break the rear tire loose. In fact, I, I think I only maybe put the bike down two or three times the whole time I had it. But the first time I ever crashed it is the worst high side I've ever had in my life. And it was like in practice, the track was wet and it was like this little straightaway and I, it, you come out of this corner and you start accelerating and I just lost the back end and I, I couldn't, it happened so quick. The back end just went like this, then it caught and it just flipped me and I've never, it literally threw me probably 15 feet in front of the bike. I landed 15 feet in front of the bike. That's how hard it high sided me. And when I went over the bars, I hit my left thigh on the bar really hard. It really hurt. And I, I got this big bruise on my thigh. And I'm like, okay, I, mean, I got a bruise on my thigh. I put my bike back together. I think I broke a lever or whatever. I raced it that day. It was fine. But um, I just had this bruise in it just wouldn't go away. I mean, like I'm nine months since I've high sided on this bike and I still have a bruise on my thigh. And I went in for my physical to my doctor and asked him, I've had this bruise on my thigh for nine months. Should I be concerned? And he's like, 
Well, probably what you did is you, you hit it so hard, you smashed the hemoglobin in the blood into your muscle tissue and essentially gave yourself a hemoglobin tattoo. And it eventually did go away, but it took like a year and a half before this bruise went away on my left um, thigh. But so one of the things, I think one of the reasons the high side was so bad is this is probably the only bike I've ever ridden that I could feel frame flex with. And like when I high sided it, all that energy, when it stopped sliding, went into the frame and it just went boing and spit me off. Um, and I could feel it when I would ride that bike hard, I could literally start feeling the frame flexing. And I knew that was like, you can't really ride this bike any harder than this because it's gonna start doing weird things. But um, let's see, so engine, uh, power wise, uh, it, really good. I mean, it is a very, very fast bike. Not a super strong bottom, but a good bottom, a really good mid, and a top end that's like top fuel dragster. And no real hitches in it. Very, very linear-ish for a, a 81 two-stroke. Uh, very fast. In fact, I had a 07 KTM 450 SXF at the time. And if the track was good and there was good traction and you were going straight, like in a straight drag race, I think it was faster than my 450 in 07. I mean, it was a fast, fast bike. Um, but it was hard to ride. You always had to respect it. Throttle control was, you know, very paramount. You could not get too overly aggressive on the throttle, especially if it was hard pack. Um, starting, there, I've heard these horror stories about KTM 495 guys. I actually remember being in Montana and Missoula at a race. I don't know if it was the same year as the 81, but I remember these guys had two KTM open bikes and they were literally going around the pits asking people if they would start their bike for them because they were scared. I heard of people hurting their ankles and breaking feet and stuff. It had the world's smallest Kickstarter. I mean, it was like this wide. The bike is a skyscraper, it's super tall, um, and so much compression that at times I could stand my whole body weight on the Kickstarter and it wouldn't even move. So a lot of compression, tiny Kickstarter, left side kick, but I never had any problems. I would literally just, you know, flip it out, kick it through top dead center, pick it up and kick the hell out of it. And if it was cold, I could start it. Usually three kicks, it would start. If it had been started that day, one kick every time. Always started first kick. Break the throttle, just give it a little throttle, kick it, always started. I mean, it it started really, really well for an open bike. Um, carburetor, it had a bing. I know uh, a lot of people, uh, you know, I don't know, I've heard bings, oh, they're kind of junky, whatever, Makuni's so much better. I never had a problem with it. Um, it had the tickler, I think is what they called it. I, don't, I, if I, I didn't make that up. I think that's what it was called, a tickler. It was basically just this rod that you would push down and it would push down on the arm that pushed on the needle and it would just allow fuel to fill the bowl too far. And then the fuel would come out the overflow for the carburetor and that was your choke. Um, and it, I kind of had to learn that you just wanted to just, as soon as you saw it come out the overflow, you wanted to stop. Because if you held it just a little bit longer, you're just dumping raw fuel in the, in the engine, it's not gonna start. But as soon as you see the fuel come out the overflow, you let off, started like a champ. I never had any problems with it. Jetting on that bike, I never touched. I cleaned the carburetor when I bought it. I think I had to put a new air boot on it. Um, but yeah, the jetting was perfect. I never touched it. It ran absolutely flawless every time I rode it. Had the dual plug head. I think there are tens, like B8 tens, BR8 E tens or something like that. Two of them though. But once again, I never fouled the plug. It ran absolutely perfect. Um, so that was good. So engine, rocket ship, but hard to ride. Uh, and you had to be careful. Um, carburation was perfect on it, never had a problem. Uh, brakes, 
not, not so good. They were pretty bad. Now, I think I put new front brake shoes on it, if I remember right. Um, but it just wasn't a very good brake. I also had a 79 RM400 before I bought my 495 or kind of overlapping. And the brakes on that 79 were way better than the, the KTM. And it was a fast bike, so it's, it's nice to have a good brake. Um, yeah, so the front brake was pretty terrible. Back brake was pretty average. Um, handling was kind of middle of the road. Very, very stable. I can see why people like to race it in the desert. Never, no head shake ever. Always very, very stable and predictable. But uh, it, it didn't really like darting down to the inside line. Um, it was more of a point and shoot kind of bike because A, the power, you really wanted to make sure you were going straight before you got on it. And it also didn't like to carve the really inside line. So I ended up riding the outside and trying to keep my momentum up so I didn't have to get on the gas so hard. And that was kind of a way to ride it. Um, I didn't always ride it that way, but you'll see. I, I mean, I was clutching it a little in the video. I do have a video at the end that you're gonna see that was shot at uh, ET Moto Park in 2009, I think. Um, I know I'm gonna look like a goon because I don't have a visor on my helmet. Earlier in the day, I crashed on my 450 pretty hard and had a pretty good concussion, to be honest. Uh, pretty bad headache and was having a hard time seeing, but I was just like, yeah, I'll just keep riding. Cause you know, I used to get, you know, back in the day when you played football there, yeah, you just rang your bell, get back in there, it's fine. So, you know, I, I know I look like a, a moron with no visor on my helmet, but I didn't have another one and I wanted to ride. So but you'll see that a little later, but um, so yeah, handling, eh, middle of the road, brakes, not so good. Uh, like ergonomics was good, uh, super tall, really tall bike, which I'm five now, I was five nine and maybe a little shorter now cause I'm getting older, but uh, it was it was pretty, pretty tall. Um, but fine, once you were going, um, build quality was excellent. I don't think I ever had anything break on that bike. The only problems I ever had was the clutch. And once I got that adjusted, it was super, super reliable, always started. I know I could let it sit in the garage for six months. If I, you know, or I would take it to the races and, uh, you know, it was a backup bike for some of that stuff. And if it hadn't been started in four months, I could have that thing running in four or five kicks and it would run perfect. I never had any problems with it. It was a very, very reliable bike. Um, overall, it was really fun because it was unique, especially in the United States. I never saw anybody with another 495 at any race I ever went to. In fact, KTMs in the vintage world were pretty rare things pretty much for any year in vintage racing um, or Pinton because that was a Pinton before that, but you just don't see a lot of them in the vintage world. So it was kind of cool to have that bike and it, you know, everybody knew it as being such a fast bike. W would it be better suited for desert riding? Maybe, I mean, the suspension's not great and the brakes aren't great. So if you're going really fast, it's yeah, but I could definitely see that it's handling characteristics and being really stable would probably be a benefit, a more of a benefit for off-road riding, especially high-speed off-road riding than moto. But it was a good motocross bike. It was a lot of fun. And I was really glad I found that bike and I raced it. Do I wish I wouldn't have sold it? Well, I kind of had to. I mean, I didn't have any space at the time. I mean, I would like to have it back. And I would certainly like to find another old KTM or Penton and fix one if I can find one that's... The biggest thing with the KTM that I found was parts are expensive and they're hard to find. I mean, they're... KTM hasn't really... It doesn't seem like they support their older bikes as much as the Japanese do. So getting parts for them can be somewhat difficult. There is, I can't remember the name. I don't even know if they're still in business anymore, but there was like a KTM Penton place that you could buy stuff from uh, in the US. I can't remember what it's called now, but um, it was a good bike. It was a fun bike. 
Obviously, um, this, you know, is a little different video than I'm, I'm doing and it may seem kind of out of order or whatever, but I just, I like that bike and I had, you know, old pictures and stuff and some video of it and I was like, eh, maybe you guys will like it. I don't know, maybe you won't. Hopefully, um, going to be doing some racing coming up in the next month or two um, and Vintage Nationals this year. Uh, is going to be the plan. I'm going to try to race four or five rounds of the Vintage Nationals and on tracks that I remember. Mostly the West Coast tracks, uh, one in Texas, uh, the one in California, uh, Thunder Valley, which I've rode Thunder Valley, but never on a vintage bike, and I didn't really like the track, but yeah, my brother lives in Denver, so or in Denver area, so I'm definitely going to that. I'm going to try to go to the one in Tennessee, Muddy Creek, I think it is. I can't remember. And then there's like one in Oklahoma at the end of the season. I would love to go to uh, the Ohio one. Um, the one where the, it's the AMA, where the AMA headquarters is and they have a big vintage weekend and like swap meet or whatever. I think it's called Mid-Ohio, but I don't know if I'm gonna, that's gonna be in the budget, um, but that's my plan. I'm gonna try to race uh, this summer, going to do uh, Vintage Nationals. So keep tuned on that. You know, I'm trying to catch up. I got other bikes that are coming down the pike as well that we, I haven't really talked about. Maybe you've seen in the background here or there, but I got some other bikes that I'm working on besides the Can-Am. Um, so that's coming up. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
So if you made it this far, uh, thanks for watching the video. Hopefully, I know it was a little different than what I normally do, but hopefully you enjoyed it. Uh, like it, subscribe, share it, whatever you want to do, and uh, hopefully we'll get some racing stuff coming pretty soon, and keep the rubber side down.